Please be seated and <clears throat> turn with me now, if you will, to the 17th chapter of the Gospel of John, part of which was read to us, the first 11 verses. <clears throat> and I would remind you that uh, two weeks ago I provided what I would call an overview of John 17. We are here in possibly the most profound chapter of the entire Gospel of John. There's a sense in which the Lord Jesus, who is preparing his disciples for world mission, for the greatest mission that could ever be given to people, the spreading of the Gospel. And let's be sure about that as we ourselves endeavour to shine For Jesus in our lives and with opportunities we have to spread the gospel, there's no greater mission than to seek to spread the gospel. No greater honour, I would say, than to do that very thing. And as the Lord Jesus is praying this great prayer of his, properly called the Lord's Prayer. What we call the Lord's Prayer is the Disciples' Prayer. As we know, we used it again this morning. This is properly the Lord's Prayer, often called his high priestly prayer because he was revealed to the world not only as the saviour of the world but the head and the high priest of his church and people. We could say that John 17, the Lord Jesus Christ is initially, chiefly, praying for his own, for his people. Although there are implications for the way we witness in the world to the world. Well, as we had the overview, I set before you a number of themes which emerge, and I will simply remind you of them without any further comment at this stage. We saw that the Lord Jesus Christ, in this profound teaching, he speaks uh, of authority, his authority. He speaks of sovereignty, God's sovereign grace. He speaks of particularity, the way God calls his people. He spoke of security, the security of God's people in his everlasting purposes. He also spoke about sanctity, that we're called not only to be saved sinners, but to be sanctified. And then we saw that there is a dimension of universality in all that Jesus is calling his disciples to do. And then we also saw our Saviour stress on unity in this chapter. And then the last thing I mentioned was there is a degree of sublimity because the Lord Jesus Christ had this to say in verse 24, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. And I concluded on that very special thought which ought to encourage us this morning because just as we would say as Christians that when our earthly pilgrimage has ceased and we die and we pass on and we enter into the glory that is above, Our greatest joy will be to see the Lord Jesus Christ. Here we see him by faith, but then we will see him by sight. And that will be a sight which will occupy our whole being for all eternity as we plumb the depths of the grandeur and the greatness and the loving kindness of our Lord Jesus Christ. But at the same time, if our heaven would not be heaven without him, for him too... His heaven would not be what it is without us. He has a very special love for you, therefore. So do keep that particular thought in mind. There's a very real sense in which we may say that as Jesus is praying for his own in a particular special way, he's praying for you. We often don't think about that. Rightly, we think about the incarnation, we think about the crucifixion, we think about the ascension, the resurrection and the ascension. But what is Jesus doing right now? He's at the right hand of the Father. He's our great high priest. He's displaying his glorified wounds as the basis of our acceptance before the Father. 
so that in the Lord Jesus Christ we are accepted and we are beloved and we're prayed for and we're cared for. So whatever concerns you have in your life, you must be sure about this, that your Saviour, who became man for us, he came down from the heights of glory to be one with us, to come alongside us, to take our sins upon himself, to deal with all our human frailties and give us the promise of eventual everlasting healing. And he's concerned about that. He's concerned about you. So that we are to keep the eye of faith clear and remember that he is there. And from that exalted state, he will yet appear in glory and majesty when he comes to judge the world in righteousness. So we should keep these things in mind. There's a very great sense in which John 17 may be described as Jesus taking us behind the scenes in the outworking of the purposes of God. Because it's foolish for us to imagine that we can understand everything about God. We don't claim that, do we? Are we still limited? Are we still restrained by our own slowness and dullness? And there is much that we don't understand now, which we will understand in, in glory. And uh, we've already been reminded from earlier chapters that the Lord Jesus Christ came into the world. He is the Word made flesh and he came to reveal the grace of God. That he came with a message not just for the Jews but for the entire world. Because he himself said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That, that is the gospel which we were again proclaiming yesterday. With the solemn aspect that people will perish, perish they will, if they do not believe, if they do not repent. So there's an urgency like no other in the preaching of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now we noticed, didn't we, last time, the way that Jesus is speaking with such authority. Look what he says in the opening verses. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that your Son may glorify you as you have given him authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Here is the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the King of kings and lord of lords he's the king of the church and here he's speaking about as many as you have given him now when we look at john 3:16 and see the universality of the gospel that god so loved the world we remember and i reminded you of this in the, in the sixth chapter of john that universality that message for all men uh, is prominent but it begins to mingle alongside it with the sovereign grace of God in calling to salvation as many as you have given him. That's in John 6.37. As many as you have given me shall come to me. And as many as come unto me I shall in no wise cast out. Now what's, what's going on here? Well let me put it to you as simply as I possibly can. That at the dawn of time so to speak after God had created the human race. Then in the ordained divine wisdom of the Most High, in his sovereignty, man was permitted to fall and to rebel against him, producing all the plight and all the problems that we're aware of in today's world, right down to the present time. And yet God who had made us still find so much in us that he can love because we are his creatures and therefore not willing that we should perish he purposed also in our need to send a saviour to send the Lord Jesus Christ there was an old book in the 18th century by Isaac Watts called The Ruin and Recovery of Mankind we ruined ourselves by foolish rebellion against God and yet, God the Father purposed to send a recoverer, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord Jesus Christ was prepared to come and to suffer and die 
for the sins of all mankind. That's the message of the scriptures. But God knew that the hard hearts of the human race are so set on rebellion against him that were it not for his sovereign grace, no one would ever believe. So in his sovereign mercy he decided to elect some, though not all, from the human race to be saved all down the ages. And that is the message of the doctrine of election as the Bible tells us about that. And it's important that we acknowledge that. There's mystery, of course, in this because only the Lord knows those who are his. Those whom he has chosen are not more worthy than the others. And this is the great stress of the New Testament. As the Lord Jesus Christ speaks about that, he speaks about his own. So these two great truths run in parallel. There is a universality of provision. But not all will be saved. Because not all will believe. And the reason why people are lost, and this must be clearly understood, is not through non-election, but through unbelief. Jesus always stresses that. It's the most important thing for us to understand. So here is the mystery of God's sovereign choice of his people. First of all, it showed itself in the choosing of the Jews, the Jewish nation. We have no problem with, it, with, it, with acknowledging that this is the Old Testament teaching, isn't it? God, out of all the nations of the earth, and they were so wicked, so corrupt, and so rebellious, he decided to call a nation, to choose a nation, the nation of the Jews. So he called Abraham and his descendants to be that people who were not only to be the people of God but also to shine with the mercy of God which was to be made at length available globally. That was their calling, to shine for God so that all the nations of the earth might be blessed. So that then God's chosen people would be gathered not from one nation but from every nation of the world. And as the gospel goes out into the world, while divine mercy is proclaimed to all mankind, some will be saved. We shouldn't automatically, as some people tend to do, think little when you think about divine election. We should think big. Why? Well, because in the book of Revelation we're told that the ultimate number of the redeemed is a great multitude which no man can number. And there are even some great Presbyterian divines like Charles Hodge who go as far as to say that they think that heaven will be more full than hell. That's something worth keeping in mind. Hell will be populated. We cannot deny that by people who, whose hearts are so hard and they're set on rebellion against God and they will not repent. And you would not have repented. You would not have come to Christ unless the Holy Spirit of God worked in your heart. Why are you here this morning? Why do you love the Lord Jesus Christ? It's not in your heart, is it? You're not so wonderfully good that uh, you came to him? No, we acknowledge that we're sinners, that we're rebels. And only when the Holy Spirit of God works within us and brings us to repentance, to see our state, and then to realize that only Jesus Christ can save us, we then willingly come to him. We chose him because he first chose us, just as we love him because he first loved us. Now this is, that is the truth which Jesus is talking about here. As you have given him authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. That is his elect people. Now this is not a very popular doctrine there's a lot of activity on Facebook where people hate this truth and they blame it on poor old Calvin as if he was the only one who taught it, which is absolute nonsense because Jesus taught it, Paul taught it, Augustine taught it, Martin Luther taught it and can you believe it, even the articles of the Church of England although you never hear about this in today's Church of England. Read Article 37 of the 39 Articles. It's all there. And so on and so forth. This is an important truth, that, therefore, which the Bible is so very clear about. And in the workings of God's grace, how is it 
we become Christians and go on in the Christian life. Well, Philip Doddridge put it like this. He says, he called me and I followed on. Charmed to confess the voice divine. So we're in a realm which is altogether out of human ego, human boasting, through free will, expertise and resources. That's the modern man. That's the atheist man. That's the man who thinks he can do without God. Well, look at the world that they produce when they try to live like that. And all that is good in the world comes from the God who is good. And all the salvation that comes to people all over the world, all down the ages, has come from his grace alone. So we have nothing but to boast of but in his sovereign grace and mercy. That, therefore, is where we must begin. The authority by which the Lord Jesus Christ speaks of gathering his own into his church. And... Uh, I hope this isn't raising questions in your mind this morning. Well, Pastor, yes, uh, election is the teaching of the Bible, Old and New Testament. Election is the teaching of uh, the faithful servants of God down the centuries. Well, how can I know whether I'm one of those who was given to the Father? Well, let me put it to you simply like this. Faith is evidence of election. Where did the faith come from that you... Exercise when you come to Jesus and you trust in him. Well, you will, I hope, believe that the Bible says, well, I have the gift of faith because it's the gift of God's grace to me. What a precious gift because it brings me to the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, my saviour. But at the same time, we must never ever think of anyone else who isn't at this moment professing Christ. You mustn't therefore, as too many people tend to do, say, well, so-and-so, he's not a believer, she's not a believer, so she's not elect and he's not elect. You can't say that. Think of Saul of Tarsus. He hated Christ. He hated Christians. He had authority to go from Jerusalem to Damascus to round up this rabble, this sect called Christianity and uh, to suppress and root out this Christianity well he didn't reckon on the sovereignty of God did he Saul the Pharisee was humbled by the risen Lord Jesus Christ and he who was the greatest enemy of the gospel became its greatest champion that sovereign grace at work and in principle that happens to every Christian are you a Christian this morning? It's because the light of the grace of God has come into your, your experience and your mind and you've been brought to acknowledge these things. It is all of God. You have nothing whatever to boast in. But we boast, of course, in, in him. So let's keep that in mind. So that there are others who are, whom we love who are not yet Christians. Don't write them off. But pray for them. That they too might come to the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's an important thing that we see at this particular point. And then that leads us, I've really combined this morning, the emphasis on the authority of the Lord Jesus to say these things in his prayer to the Father and the sovereignty of, of his grace which covers down from um, verses 3 to 5 this is eternal life that they might, may know you the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent I have glorified you on the earth I have finished the work which you have given me to do and now O oh Father glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was which then leads us on to verses 6 to 11 where we see our Lord's teaching and I would simply call it particularity. And I'll explain that as we go on. Look at verses 6 to 11. As I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world, they were yours, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given to them the words which you have given me, and they have Receive them and have known surely that I came forth from you and they have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. 
and all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. Now what is Jesus saying at this particular point? It's profound teaching, isn't it? I wouldn't think there are many sermons in Norwich to go no further dealing with subject matter like this. But it is profound teaching. We should not pretend that it's easy to understand. It has so often been misunderstood and that has caused too many problems within the Christian church. And I put it to you like this. When Jesus says in verse 9, I pray for them, I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. Does that possibly sound a little bit of a contradiction to what Jesus said in John 3.16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, and you get the impression from that wonderful gospel text that the care of God for humanity is universal. And you're right to draw that conclusion. The same appeared in John 6. Where he says that he is the bread of heaven who gives himself for the life of the world. But then there was that teaching about election coming in. And here it is again in John chapter 17. So you might say, well when Jesus says, I do not pray for the world... It seems as if he's saying, I don't care for the world. I just care for those whom you have given me. And that, sadly, has been a false interpretation of the meaning of that verse, which has created so many wrong problems uh, in uh, evangelism. And it's important that we get this right. What, therefore, does it mean? Well, we must keep this in mind, and I'll cover this in a later sermon, that in this prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ, It's a bit like dropping a pebble into a still pool. And the pebble drops and it plops. And it sends out ripples. There's one ripple and then another ripple and then another ripple. You know the kind of thing I'm trying to describe. The prayer in John 17 may be likened to that. It starts off with our Lord's concern for his disciples. And then he goes on to pray for those who shall believe their testimony through gospel preaching. And then the outer ripple he goes on to show that the witness of the church in the world is that the world might believe that Jesus Christ is sent by the Father into the world. I hope that picture helps you because that's how we are to understand it. So when Jesus says in verse 9, I pray for them, I do not pray for the world, what he's really saying at that stage in the prayer is that I'm thinking about my disciples, the twelve, if you like. And in that stage in his prayer, he's praying particularly for the disciples. At that point, he's not praying for anybody else. He's not praying even for those who will believe the gospel through their testimony and he's certainly not thinking about the wider world at this stage in the prayer he is praying for his disciples and if you don't get that basic point which the flow of the text makes plain you're going to come to some very false conclusions for example and I don't wish to mention this really but I I have to in the in, in, for the sake of those who misunderstand this that there are people who take hold of John 17 verse 9 and they say Jesus does not pray for all because he did not die for all. Now that's a complete misunderstanding of what Jesus is saying here because we've already established from the scriptures, haven't we, that there is a sense in which the Lord Jesus Christ died for the whole world. But there is a special sense in which he died for his people. And those two things coexist side by side in our understanding of the gospel. Richard Baxter, for example, when he comments on his his verse, uh, and I'm paraphrasing what he said, 
he's really saying that Jesus is saying here, uh, right now, Father, I am praying for the twelve whom you have given to me. I have a special love for my own. I have other prayers for others and for the world, but right now I'm thinking about the disciples, that they may be blessed, that they might be saved, that they might be kept, that they might be sanctified. So he's concentrating here on his special love for his own, which of course also applies to God's elect in every age and generation. And also there's a sense in which we may may say that just as Christians, believers, have particular needs which unbelievers don't have, so Jesus is praying in particular for the needs that you and I have, that the disciples had, and all God's people in every age have. So we should keep that in mind. There is a general love of God for the world. There is a general love of Christ for the world. There is a general love in which... Jesus Christ died for the world. The Bible is quite clear about that. But there's also a special love in which his grace is applied to the elect. The scriptures are perfectly clear about that kind of teaching. And even John Calvin himself, who is blamed for so much, has a very clear explanation of John 17 verse 9 which is quite against the way it's been abused by them, those who later have claimed his name. This is what John Calvin says in his commentary on John 17, 9. He openly declares that he does not pray for the world, for he is solicitous only for his own flock, the disciples, which he received from the Father's hand. But this might seem absurd, for no better rule of prayer can be found than to follow Christ as our guide and teacher. But we are commanded to pray for all. And Christ himself afterwards prayed for all indiscriminately. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. His prayer on the cross. I replied, the prayers which we utter for all are still limited to God's elect. That is their efficacy. We ought to pray, listen to this. We ought to pray that this and that and every man may be saved and so embrace the whole human race because we cannot yet distinguish the elect from the reprobate, we pray for the salvation of all whom we know to have been created in God's image and who have the same nature as ourselves, and we leave to God's judgment those whom he knows to be reprobate, to be rejected. And that's an incredibly wise understanding of that particular text. Baxter said the same sort of thing as John Calvin says there. It's so important that we understand that. So don't misunderstand the false particularity of John 17, 9. Yes, he's praying for them. He's, special, he's praying special prayers for them. That's what he means, I do not pray for the world. Not at this moment in the prayer. I have special thoughts for my own. That's really what Jesus is saying there. So what do we see at this particular point? And uh, on this I try to draw to a, conclus- to a, a conclusion this morning. Uh, th- th- these are vastly profound things. And it's the teaching of the scriptures which uh, motivates me to present it as clearly and as faithfully as I possibly can. As I look back over church history, I've so often been grieved at the way that error has come into the church. And then there are those who have responded to the error, but they have overreacted. They've lost the balance of truth. A bit like a tightrope walker. You know, a tightrope walker requires great skill, doesn't he? To walk the tightrope and not to fall off one side or the other. Any fool can fall off to the left or to the right. It takes great skill to keep upright. And that's where true... Christian theology will recognize the whole fabric of God's word and not say things at the expense of other things in the Bible, but take it as a whole, even as our Lord Jesus Christ teaches us here. So let's keep this in mind then. Jesus is reminding us, he's explaining to us ultimately why it is that some are saved. 
and some are not. More of that uh, another time. But it's important that we, we understand what he is saying and avoid what he is not saying here in John 17, 9. So then, yes, the sovereignty of God is working through with his purposes. But that doesn't deny the universality of God's loving kindness, the universality of John 3, uh, 16. And I couldn't help but think that um, not only John Calvin, but also um, Richard Baxter, but um, our friend uh, J.C. Ryle. I, I hope I'm not being presumptuous, but I do believe that um, if J.C. Ryle was to be here this morning, hearing what I'm trying to say on a difficult subject, if he was sitting, say, over in the corner, he would be saying, uh, Amen, Alan, uh, tell them God's truth, don't distort it, don't go beyond it, but don't go be beneath it, and so on and so forth. And this is what Ryle has to say about this particular verse. He says, We must take care that we do not forget that our Lord Jesus Christ does take a special interest in his believing people and does do special things for them which he does not do for the wicked and unbelieving. On the other hand, we must not forget that our Lord pities all, cares for all, and has provided salvation sufficient for all mankind. There is no escaping the text which says of the wicked that they deny the Lord that bought them. Second Peter 2.1 The most fair and honest interpretation of the text, God so loved the world, is to regard the world as meaning all mankind. You see what we're saying? Ryle admits it's, it's difficult to... It's the tightrope problem, you see. And then he says this. Because as far as the church is concerned, as far as these disciples are concerned, what, what, is, what is their mandate? What was Jesus commanding them to do? Well, shortly before his ascension, we know what Jesus said. What did he say? Mark 16, verse 15. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. In other words, there is something in the blessing of Calvary's cross to be available and to be preached to every man, woman and child who has ever lived. That's clearly the teaching of the scriptures. And then Ryle says this, I will give place to no one in maintaining that Jesus loves all mankind, came into the world for all, died for all, provided redemption sufficient for all, calls on all, invites all, commands all to repent and believe and ought to be offered to all, freely, fully, unreservedly, directly, unconditionally, without money and without price. If I did not hold this, I dare not go into a pulpit and I should not understand how to preach the gospel. That's powerful stuff, you know. There are some people that claim the name of Calvin. They wouldn't be happy with that, but I'm happy with it. I wouldn't dare to go into the city centre unless I stood with Ryle and with Baxter and with Calvin. These things are so vital. So we must understand, therefore, what our Lord Jesus Christ is saying. And we will go on later to understand the, the ripple effect of this prayer which will give further evidence of what we're about and what the gospel is all about. Notice what Jesus, and on this thought I closed this morning, in John 17, verse 18, as you sent me into the world, he says to his Father, I also have sent them into the world to declare the universal love of God. And let us be faithful in doing what he has commanded. And leave the outcome, leave the consequences to God's wisdom, who is never unjust in any of his ways. If men are saved, they have only God to thank. If people are lost, they have only themselves to blame. Keep that thought in mind, as well as everything else I've tried to share with you. But let this be your confidence that here is Jesus showing a particular regard for his people. 
for his disciples in every age. Therefore for you. And as you face life, the challenges of life, the infirmities of life, sickness and our mortality. And let's remember that this will come to us all, won't it? We've been thinking of the way that young men were mowed down by German machine guns on D-Day. One moment they were chatting to their mates and then they breathed their last. There is more than one way of dying. And we're all mortal. The important thing, therefore, the most urgent thing for us all is to, while we hear the gospel, come to Jesus Christ for salvation. And he will save us. He will save you everlastingly. And also supply grace as he does to his special believing people. With all our infirmities and weaknesses, he promises to supply your every need. So confide in him. He's praying for you. And he loves you. And nothing will ever separate you from the love of Christ, the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Now the hymn I have chosen this morning to end with encourages us to look out in gospel witness. Last time we had Robert Murray McShane's hymn about God's sovereignty and grace. Chosen not for good in me, wakened up from wrath to flee. Now we remember the universal aspect of what Jesus calls us to bear witness to in hymn 450. Hymn 450. We have heard the joyful sound, Jesus saves. Spread the tidings all around, Jesus saves. Bear the news to every land, climb the steeps and cross the waves. Onward tis our Lord's command, Jesus saves. Let us sing, 450. and cross the waves onward tis our Lord's command Jesus saves sing above the battle strife Jesus saves by his death and endless life Jesus saves sing it soft through the gloom when the heart for mercy craves sing in triumph over tomb Jesus saves give the winds a mighty voice Jesus saves let the nations now rejoice Jesus saves, shout salvation full and free, highest hills and deepest caves, this our song of victory, Jesus saves. Our loving Father, we thank you for the certainty of your gracious purposes, which will be fulfilled. We thank you for the means of grace by which you call us to yourself. Lord, may we obey your every command to trust in you and to serve you in making the good news of salvation available to as many as we possibly can reach. Bless us and lead us on, Lord, to your glory. And so now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the blessing of the Holy Spirit rest upon us and remain with us and with God's people everywhere this day and forevermore. 
Amen.